ended off with a lot of discussion on this uh, Hazard study around the applied heat shock. And that really does conclude the section on hazard operability study. Um, but you may have noticed that we've really just been looking here so far at hazards and not considered operability. And that's what today's class is starting to head into towards is the operability section. Well, in the rest of the notes that you have, we have this small section on just introducing the concept of operability and then I'll move over to the other set of notes that I put on the course website yesterday. And we'll look at operability in a more coherent manner over the next three weeks. So between now and about the, the 17th, 18th of November, we'll be considering operability. And for those groups that have had meetings with myself already, the tough questions that came up in the meetings were really around operability. So it's kind of asking you questions on things that we haven't really covered yet. So you feel like, okay, this was really a tough meeting. So, and it was, right? For many of you, there was like stuff that you've never thought about. We're going to start to see some of those topics in the section coming up next. But, um, so where this comes in is because when you look at the hazard and operability study, you sit back and, and that very last column, the call is this, this entry here, actions to be taken. So these actions are taken, we saw that yesterday, this very simple drawing up here ended up being a fairly complicated PNID of sensors and valves and safety equipment to keep that unit safe. Okay, so that's really where the operability section is, and it's how we identify these unsafe conditions, and now let's go and prove that by adding equipment to make our process more reliable, to make it safe, to make it easy to maintain, and to make the process flexible. So we're going to see all of those topics coming up next. Here's just a few examples, and I want you to think about this one. Uh, take a minute and draw and add to this diagram what you think will be necessary here. So let's take a look at what's going on. We've got a unit where we've got material being processed in this reactor, and we've got a pump to take that out of the reactor afterwards. So this is a constant speed positive displacement pump. So we've seen one of these before. This comes out here. We have a, a relief system here, right? That, and that's where we've seen it. We've seen this positive displacement pump in the context of relief valves that we've needed relief over there in case something gets blocked up in this pipe. So we measure this flow, we exchange heat with the stream, and then that goes down onto another reactor or another unit. We're exchanging heat here with another process stream. So some other hot stream is being used, um, and we're taking its heat up. What we're interested in here is how do we manipulate that flow? So we want this flow to vary in the stream. How can we manipulate and vary that flow when we've got a positive displacement pump? So the first question you, you should be asking yourself is why do we even have a positive displacement pump? When do we use positive displacement pumps? When you're pumping slurry. Yeah. Right. What's one of the advantages of, of positive displacement pumps if you're pumping slurry? Um, they must trans, I think they jam. Right, so, well, I, I know they can get jammed, but like, I know that if they run dry, they'll still be okay. Like, the equipment's integrity is going be. Uh, it won't be damaged. It won't be damaged. If we look back also at our. At our Maybe or maybe not have covered that. If we're looking at the pump curve for a positive displacement pump, we've got flow, this is head. A regular centrifugal pump will have a curve that looks like that. The positive displacement pump will deliver constant flow at any head. So this is centrifugal, and this is So T has the disadvantage of operating at constant flow. So you set that speed and it keeps going, and you'll get your, your flow, and you can pump anything there through there, slurries, viscous materials, uh, liquids, and so forth. So it's really great for pumping viscous type material and slurries. Only problem is, if we need to vary the flow, this guy is going at a constant speed, that's typically how they're manufactured. How do we vary that flow over there? What's one of the ways we, how, how might we do that? Take a minute to think how would you implement the system if you wanted this flow to change 
to be higher and lower, how much you do that from these parts? So take a minute and, and add to the drawing any instrumentation, piping, valves, equipment that you need. This is where <coughs> operability comes in, right? So operability, so far in all your courses you've learned the basics. Now we're going to take it and make our process a little bit more flexible, a little easier to use on a daily basis. So if we want to vary that flow, how might we adjust our process to get to that? Think of some interesting ways you can do that. Or all of the time, you just want to vary that flow, so go from lower rates to, to higher rates. Suggestions? Yeah. Uh, are we able to vary the setting on the pump so that it goes constant speed, either high, or constant flow, higher or lower, depending on the feedback? Constant speed, so it's just driven at one one flow, one one motor speed. inside the line of that this PD pump is discharging into, any valve along here is going to be a huge risk if it's closed or even slightly closed, building up a, a huge pressure causing it to relieve the waste material. Okay, so when we were looking at that, what did we do in that context? Back, back a few classes ago, what did we say we would do? And we said we would maybe recycle some of the material back around into the reactor so that we don't relieve and waste. So if we're thinking of recycle then in that context, how can we recycle in here and still vary flow perhaps? We just have a streamer of the pump, that's the question. I have a valve in there to adjust the amount of the sample. Okay, so if we're opening a valve, then where do we recycle back into? It's like the bottom of the reactor. Back into the tank. Okay, so recycle from after the pump back into the tank with a valve. So that will divert some of our flow away from going up here. The, the okay, so there's a there's the suggestion. So if you, if you draw it, that might be one way of doing it, as Sarah suggested, is take a, a stream over here, divert some of it out of this line with that valve and feed it back into the tank. So your, tank, your tank's level will fluctuate. And what we do is we manipulate that flow by adjusting that valve opening. We want a greater flow, we close the valve. If we want a smaller flow, we open that valve. And so this is the principle of operability, right? So we've, we have to think about how we can make our processes work for us in an easy manner. Um, and a lot of what operability topic is, is just looking at many case studies. So you're going to sit back here over the next two, three weeks and think, how was I supposed to know this? How was I supposed to know this? A lot of it just comes from practice and experience. And once you see a few examples, you quickly pick up um, how to do it yourself in the future. Okay, so here's one example of that. So let's take a look at another example of operability. This is related to compressors. And I want to look at this because pretty much every group has a compressor in their project. And we have to understand what, how these compressors work. Okay. If you haven't yet read up on compressors, 
uh, please make sure you do so. There's a, a lot of good material on compressors out there, um, particularly how they're driven and the, and the different styles of drives for those compressors. Now, what is a compressor's purpose? Okay, so increase the pressure of the air. So the pressure downstream of the compressor is higher than the inlet pressure. So P here at the feet, this pressure is low, this pressure here on the outlet is high. That's the main purpose of the compressor. What's a compressor that you've seen every day or regularly? An example of a compressor. Refrigerator. Refrigerator has a compressor. The jet engines on an aircraft are simply just compressors. That's all that they're doing. Right? That they're, they're changing the velocity through there and co-creating lift on the aircraft. So nothing more than a, it's just a big four, four compressors on an aircraft. So if we, we're feeding in air at whatever pressure comes in or any, any feed stream, take it to a higher pressure and it comes out there at the other end. Now a compressor also operates exactly like a centrifugal pump. It has an operating curve. So if we look at the operating curve for the compressor, it's Now looking at a, at a regular uh, flow versus head curve, at a particular speed that that compressor motor is rotating at, and they'll always rotate at a fixed speed. So we, we don't vary the speed of a compressor on a variable basis. We pick a speed and operate at that speed. We may go to another higher speed and operate at that speed, but it's not something that you continually move up and down. Okay? So keep that speed constant, and for a given speed, you'll be operating along this curve. So if you close the feed flow, you reduce your feed flow, and you reduce, you reduce, you reduce your feed flow, you can get higher pressures or greater head at the outlet. So that's how we can alter the pressure downstream that you want, is simply we drop down our feed flow rate. We'll get a higher pressure leaving at a constant speed on the motor. But think of the physics of what's going on here. If we go to smaller and smaller flows of feed, our pressure gets to a certain point that we're delivering. So we've got a high pressure here, we've got a low pressure out there on the entry. What happens when we've got an imbalance in pressure? You'll get back flow through the compressor. Right, so if we get to a certain point where that feed flow is too low, this pressure that's out here, this higher pressure, is going to actually drive that compressor into reverse. So regularly it's rotating in one direction. At some point, if you're feeding too slow, you're not providing enough material, there's not enough momentum coming in here, that compressor will reverse. The drive shaft will jam into the bearings and you'll get metal flying and injury. Okay, So it's something you definitely avoid. So if the company providing the compressor for you will give you a surge curve a surge region that you, you will avoid. <coughs> we will never operate our compressor, or we cannot actually operate our compressor into that area. You want to operate well away from it. So your, the rule is if you're starting to head to the surge region, you increase your flow to get, get away. So if, you start, if you're heading down to, towards surge, you need to provide more feed. Okay, so what can we do to provide more feed if we're heading to that surge region is to add something like this on our compressors. So we'll add a loop back to our compressor where we control that feed. We want to be absolutely sure that that feed rate coming into the compressor stays well away from the surge region. So my flow needs to remain away from the surge region and my flow controller is going to do that. Think of these things, these are pressures, these change rapidly, right? So we need a feedback control system that can change a variable and very rapidly achieve a certain response. And this recycle loop will do that for you. If this valve opens, very quickly you're able to send more feed back in to the compressor and keep your flow away from the surge point. Now, when we're compressing, compressing over there, we, there's an inevitable increase in temperature. Um, so what we want to do is we cool down our stream after the compressor, cool it down, 
and we take this feedback after the coolant, after it's been cooled, and send it back in. So to prevent heat recycles through the compressor. Okay, so always recycle after the coolant. And what else is missing from this diagram? There's a piece of important equipment missing. Okay, compressors should never receive any liquid. No liquid ever coming into a compressor. So we put a little knockout drum over there. So a small knockout drum in line to avoid any liquid coming in. So simply just a small vessel, horizontal or vertical, and feed your liquid, your, your stream in there. Any liquid will get knocked out and, and remain in, in the vessel, and then the vapor can continue on. You can periodically bleed off that any condensed liquid. Especially if you've got a recycle here, after cooling, you could potentially condense out some liquid elements from that vapor stream, and that gets recycled back. So to prevent any of that liquid from coming back into your compressor, you do that. OK, so this diagram also explains uh, why turbulence happens in an air airplane. So turbulence, you've all experienced that. It's not very pleasant. You're flying into a hot air jet. So that lift is not able to be sustained by the aircraft anymore. That aircraft will, will, will drop like that because of the reduction in lift. Okay, so you're, you're simply moving along one of those curves. It also explains why aircraft will fly at very high altitudes, right? The air is thinner up there, there's less resistance, but they cannot just go up and up to an infinite point because there's a point where that flow coming into the aircraft jet will stall the engine. So they have to drop that down to a lower altitude. So that happens regularly. You may not realize it, but on long distance aircraft trips, the plane will regularly stall because they're trying to go just as high as they possibly can without stalling, but they will sometimes stall so then they drop back to lower altitude. So again, aircraft just simply compresses following that curve. Another one here, let's take a look at this. We've looked at this before. Um, has an operability so as we said, the last thing we want to do is damage our pipes here. So we've got this flame boiling onto a pipe, we're creating bubbles in that riser, so water comes in down on the down comer, gets heated up and bubbles up. So that loop happens uh, by, by itself, the physics of the bubbles rising will draw more water into the down comer. So that recirculation occurs there on its own. But if there's no liquid in this, in this vessel over here, then that um, will damage our pipe. So we've seen this, this explanation before. If there's no liquid in there, we want to raise an alarm. So we've got our level control firstly. Then our next level of protection is to raise an alarm to the operator. If the operators are not able to respond fast enough, the next level we go to is our SIS system. Basic <coughs> controls, alarms, then SIS. What do we trigger on that SIS system? We, we looked at this a bit yesterday. The moment there's an SIS, that level is too low, indicating we're going to start melting our tubes. What do we start, what do we want to trigger in that? Cut the gaps and lower an air like get all the extra fuel up. So cut the fuel gas immediately and, and, and increase the air to get all the fuel out. Okay, so what instrumentation do we need to add to this drawing to get that done? That, that fuel gas. Do we just use that valve and send a signal from SIS to shut that valve? So we've learned we need, we need that independence between the layers. So an SIS system should use a, a separate valve. So we go to adding an additional valve up there. This is a lock valve. And we want to close that as well as close this original fuel valve. So my original fuel valve was down here. I want to close that as well as adding an valve upstream that will make sure that that fuel is absolutely closed. So this valve here, this control valve, uh, may not get it to 100% closed, especially considering that this regular valve on a day-to-day -day op uh, operation is moving up and down. 
it's going to, in regular use, it may not seat itself properly so that the seals on that valve may not close 100% when it's in the fully shut position. So we add an upstream valve that is a block valve that will totally, totally block off the line. And we trigger both of these valves with our SIA system. So when that level is low, this is an independent measurement of level. So we don't re reuse this level sensor. We add a new level sensor, send that signal to SIS. SIS will then we'll use those three-way solenoid valves we considered before in the class, and they'll shut both those valves for us. So additional costs to keep our process operating safely to protect our equipment. So in, the, in, your, in your projects and in your, in your future work as, as engineers, basic process control systems, alarms, SIS, on critical variables. So we'll, we'll always add those to our diagrams. p ids get pretty messy uh, on, on sections of the process that have high degrees of um, hazards. So this is not uncommon to see this, especially around something on a unit like the boiler or and there's potential for unsafe operation. Any questions on this section so far? So I'll leave the last few slides. There's a, they're just made, made in text, and there are all sorts of things that I've covered during the lectures prior to this class um, that talk about how HAZOPs are run, um, the composition of a HAZOP team, um, how, how HAZOPs um, are, the results are recorded. A lot of just stuff that's fairly straightforward. Um, so I'll leave that for you to read on your own time. I've, there's some mention here about how companies will call hazards uh, different things. So some companies will call them fault trees, FMEAs, consequence analysis, human error analysis, or they'll, um, they'll so just different terminology around this section. So we won't we won't go into those details. Very company specific. Um, we also spoke last class about how different companies will rate things in terms of severity, probability, or likelihood, and then cost. They'll use scales of HML, high, medium, or low. They'll use a ranking from 1 to 10 or a ranking from 1 to 5. So many um, variations on this. But the principle behind it is all the same. Okay, so please read through that on your own time. And again, as I said, nothing in there is is new, it's all stuff I've covered before. I just want to end up with a final point. Um, people, as I said, right at the start of the section on hazard operability, people often have a negative sense for hazards, right? And I use that example of you walking into a, into a refinery or into any, any processing facility, and you're standing around there with this equipment, and you do want other engineers to perform the hazard as well, okay, so that the environment you're working in is safe. Remember, our goal is that your safety at work is no different to your safety at home. Where you have full control of, over things at home, you'd like your safety at work where you don't have any control of things to be as safe. So when it comes to hazards, people are like, well, we can get by without them. Um, but bear in mind that if you want to be insured and if you want to have a, a reasonable measure of running your process with out of harming your neighbors and your employees, you need to document and prove that you've done the necessary work. And the only way you can do that documentation, it's not good enough to say, well, here's my PID, I've done the safety. Okay, safety is taken care of. You need to document the procedure that, that has shown that you've thought about the various um, problems. So HAZOP is the only way that you can document that in a professional manner and in a way that's accepted um, by other people. So that's, that's the main reason for, for hazards. The other thing is it's interesting that over the past 20, 30 years, we remember we spoke at the start of the section on Bhopal, right? So Union Carbide, the company responsible for the Bhopal incident, not, they, they were barely touched, right? The Indian government tried to subpoena the CEO to come for a court trial in India. The US government refused. 
Okay, so if there was a period of time where you could hide behind your company, not anymore. Okay, companies now are very will get prosecuted, and the employees in the company get prosecuted directly. So you cannot hide behind the safety of your company um, to avoid these. And also, it's very uh, right now. What they will definitely do is revoke your professional engineering license. Okay, so any unsafe safe operation can lead to drastic consequences. Do you have, do you have a form seem to be stamped by a professional engineer or anything? No, professional engineering stamps are for drawings and for design purposes. So like for, let's say like you change it to PID results, then you need a professional engineer. Yeah, so drawings, if the moment that gets changed and reissued, the professional engineer is to stamp that for you. Yeah, which they should then be asking, has that has not been done on those changes? Okay, so there's a little comment here in the notes prior to, to this on changes. So we've, we've kind of considered that HAZOPs are part of a new process, so you haven't built it yet. And that's true, that's a good point, and where HAZOPs should be done. But if you're making changes to an existing process, you should also HAZOP that change to prove that, that, it's, um, that that's important. Anything else on the hazard and operability? Set of notes. Um, let's think with the hazards, we present in our product, we examine one node and the parameters of that node. Yeah. Can we, for operability, should we be looking at the same node or the operability of our whole? Okay, so we're going to look at operability next, and you'll see that it's not something you do on one node, it's something that's done.